have a special guest uh, speaker from the Institute of Liaison, uh, uh, ISL, Vasilis Papadakis, Vaila Vasilis. Vasilis has a, got an, a, a diploma of uh, a Bachelor of uh, Physics from the University of Athens, and then he moved to the Medical School of Crete, where he uh, did his PhD on uh, imaging uh, the biomedical applications. Uh, now he's a researcher at the ISL, and uh, in parallel, he's collaborating with the biological, uh, biology department of Crete, uh, with the people working on uh, fish uh, culture. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, today in this uh, talk, we will mainly focus on spectral imaging diagnostics for this technique. And, uh, what is spectral imaging? Well, it's an unusual technique that is optical, non-destructive, non-invasive, and uh, non-contact, which actually allows us to enhance the diagnostic information that we can extract from tissues from various samples. In this uh, example, we have uh, the back uh, of the eye, the retina, where this is the common image that is acquired by the pharmacologist. By using spectral imaging and performing some analytical techniques, you can enhance the image, the contrast between specific pigments like hemoglobin here. On the, with the red color and the background which is the green and by enhancing uh, the information it's uh, much easier for the doctors to uh, perform the diagnosis of specific uh, diseases. I'll tell you some basics about uh, what uh, light matter interactions are responsible for spectral imaging as a technique. Well, you're, I, I believe that you're aware of that, but uh, mainly we have the reflection where light is being detected by the surface of the sample. We have the absorption where uh, photons are being absorbed by uh, the uh, sample the tissue. We have scattering where light is not absorbed but it's scattered inside the material. And transmission where light is being uh, detected from the uh, other side of the, uh, the path that initially comes uh, to the sample. Uh, we will focus mainly on the absorption reflectance uh, light matter interaction, where light is being absorbed by the sample and some light is being reflected back to our sensors. And that light that comes uh, back, the backscattered light, contains information about the sample. And we also have fluorescence uh, imaging where high energy photons are being absorbed by the tissue and are being uh, re-emitted back with uh, lower energy. You're much more uh, familiar with fluorescence and believe than I am. Okay, so spectroscopy. We talk about imaging spectroscopy, so we have two different parts. We have imaging and we have spectroscopy. To perform spectroscopy, the most common instrument that is being used is a spectrometer like this one, where we have the fiber optic that collects light uh, from a specific point of, of our sample of tissue. The light is being analyzed through a grating, and it's, been, um, it's shining one uh, line CCD1 array sensor that is actually responsible for <coughs> measuring the number of photons that are in each uh, point of the array, in each element of the array. By doing that, we can actually acquire this reflection spectrum here that you see, that it's a signature of the material that we're studying. That was the spectroscopy part. What is the imaging part? What is an image? If you take one image uh, from your computer from anywhere, a digital image, and you make a magnification, you will find out that there are some specific uh, points that are called pixels. The image has a specific number of pixels, which uh, is responsible by the, um, for the spatial resolution, the total spatial resolution of uh, your sample that you're uh, imaging. So you have the X and Y 
k-match resolution, and each pixel has a specific value. That value, we call it, that has 24 bits of color, which actually is not something very difficult to understand. It has one red, one green, and one blue parameter. So this is what we call trichromatic color. It's exactly like the human eye, the trichromatic vision that we have with the cones in our eye. So these three colors that you see, if you mix them, you get that purple um, faint color that you see on the specific pixel. So these three colors have one specific value, 224, 163, and 128. This value is a representative of the 8-bit color for each uh, color coordinate, the red, the green, or the blue. So you see that it's not actually three colors, it's three values that are um, exactly what you see here with uh, the gray values, the higher the number, the higher the uh, intensity reflected by the, uh, by the uh, uh, square, so the higher the gray value. And the mix of those gives you this specific color. It's, it's important to say that this is trichromatic. So you, we only measure three different parameters, three different spectral ranges, in order to, to measure color. We will see uh, following that it's a little different with spectral imaging. Another important characteristic is contrast, because when you want to see a feature on your image, you have to have a good contrast between the background and the feature that you want to uh, image, uh, observe, and uh, this is calculated by this formula. There are many instruments uh, used for this, uh, for imaging, especially in the visible. There are multiple number of different sensors and cameras that uh, mainly focused uh, on the silicon detector. But if you want to image a different spectral region, um, you need to, to have a, a specific uh, sensor of a different material that is sensitive, let's say, in the infrared or in the UV uh, part. So what is imaging spectroscopy? Like we said, imaging, you have an object, and you actually take the image of that object through some optics, and you record that image onto an array sensor that each pixel has one specific value, like we said before. Now, each pixel might have a filter on top of it, the red, the green, and the blue, and we can reconstruct the color information as we know it. On the other hand, with the spectroscopy, we can only measure one single point, and with this single point, with the specific optics and the spectrometer that we saw, we can actually get a very analytic information, uh, spectral information, of the reflectance of the light that is in, uh, uh, coming out of the, of the center, the backscattered light. Uh, in imaging spectroscopy now, we try to combine those two techniques into one, which means that we want to, to have also the image information, the spatial information of the sample, along with the spectral information that comes from a specific point. So in each pixel, to, to be able to record the full reflection spectrum coming out of the, of the object. So why do we need that? The human eye, although it's a very, very good sensor, it's limited to three, to do two different um, parameters. One is the chromatic vision, which means that we have the cones and the rows into our eye, which are actually covering a wide spectral range from 400 up to 500 for the blue cones, the 450 up to 550, 600 with the green cones, and the red cones that are a little broader. And then the combination of those three parameters give us the color. And the second limitation that we have is that it's only sensitive to the region between 400 and 700 nanometers, which we refer the blue the visible uh, range of the spectrum, starting from blue 400 up to the red, which is the 700 nanometers. So why is it a limitation? It's a limitation because if you have similar absorbing pigments, 
you will find out that it's very difficult to, do, to quantify exactly what pigment exists in your sample. We have here three similar pigments that with your eye you can actually tell, yes, they are different. I can see that they are different. But if I didn't have the names uh, below the three samples, would you ever be able to, to tell me, oh, this is the cinnabar red, this is the uh, minium or the hematite? I believe not. You have to be very, very, very uh, well trained in order to do that. So <coughs> how do we quantify measurements? There are the various color, um, color meter uh, systems that are actually ca are calibrated for three parameters, the, the red, the green, and the blue. And they can provide you numbers for the three color parameters uh, for each sample. And by knowing those numbers, you can have an estimation about what each pigment is. And the second one, which is the reflection spectrum, that you can actually get from one single point exactly all the curve, all the spectral characteristics of the reflectivity of the sample. So why is it important to be sensitive beyond the visible spectrum? There are many pigments that we have found that are approximately similar, very similar in the visible region, they have the same hue, the same appearance, but they can be differentiated strongly in the near infrared or in the UV part. One example is the water. You know that water is not only, you can see it very clearly, it's a pure red here with uh, pure water inside, it's very clear, and you can see the pigment behind the cuvette and the water. And this cuvette is transparent in the visible region of the spectrum, you all know that very well, but what if we start imaging this cuvette, the same picture in the higher wavelengths, in the different part, uh, specifically at four, uh, 1400 nanometers, where absorption, there's a thick absorption peak at that uh, range, and you can see that it's dark, it's highly absorbing, while some other pigments, like this one here, number four, uh, you can see the other way around, it's becoming completely transparent, while the other one up here is still absorbing in this wavelength range. Okay, so the instruments that exist in the market that are responsible for spectral imaging are divided in two categories. One is called multispectral, and the other one is called hyperspectral. What's the difference between them? The multispectral refers to a number of filters that are used, a number of uh, spectral bands, approximately up to 20, 30, a few tenths of uh, uh, spectral ranges. While hyperspectral, you can tune your system in any number, of any way that you want, uh, with uh, you know, the changes of every one or two nanometers. The tuning is that. Regarding multispectral imaging, here at Florp, we have developed one system called IRIS. It's a simple multispectral imaging uh, sensor that uh, incorporates approximately 30 filters and covers a range from 400 up to 1 micron and um, with 5 megapixel resolution and coupled uh, with a microscope it can provide information about uh, biology samples. The application that we can have with this, uh, a system like that is there are two. One is real-time imaging which is what we call spectroscopy and we can actually observe the sample at specific wavelength in real time. So whatever we do, we are able to observe um, the changes in the specific wavelength that we are interested in. <coughs> and the second application is the offline imaging spectrometry, where we acquire a full set of all the images that we can get from our sample, and then offline reconstruct the three-dimensional cube where each pixel uh, has a specific reflection spectrum based on the number of filters that we have. On the first case, I will show you some examples, which is from the back of the <laughs> um, sample field imaging. We know that sample field has a peak absorption of 450 nanometers. This is the absorption curve of uh, sample field. So by selective imaging 
on uh, a specific uh, point of 450, we can get an image like that. We also know that in the macula, on the center of the uh, retina, where the vision uh, or all the cones are being concentrated, we have a high uh, concentration of sanctity. So by doing that, we are able to observe exactly what the distribution of xanthophyll on the center of the eye is. Another example is hemoglobin imaging, where we know that the absorption curve of uh, hemoglobin has a peak absorption of uh, 550 nanometers in the green area, where you can actually enhance the contrast and uh, have a better view where, in this, in this specific case, where hemorrhages exist, where exactly blood hemoglobin pigment exists. If you have now even more uh, spectral bands that you, can, you are able to uh, analyze your sample with, you can see that at 530 nanometers, we have a completely different image of the retina, like the one we have at 640 nanometers. This mm -hmm. is the green light and this is the red light. Hemoglobin is not absorbing at 640 nanometers, so it's becoming a little bit transparent. So by doing that, you see that all hemoglobin pigment, all hemorrhages that are very clearly visible here, are not present anymore. Why? Some areas that are still absorbing are responsible uh, uh, for some uh, pigment indica indication. So there is a high concentration of some pigment, uh, I believe melanin, in uh, this specific case. And of course, if you uh, do that, you can also, uh, also check for some other diseases in higher contrast because you're eliminating all the other features of your sample. And you can actually uh, map where the specific uh, pathology lipidic exudates uh, exist on the retina. One other example that we uh, are working right now is uh, diagnosis of neural uh, merely loss in samples. These are the actual visible images uh, on the microscope, on microscope uh, multispectral images and maps that we can get for <coughs> our samples. And if you enhance them with spectral imaging, uh, you can actually get images like that without any tissue labeling, labeling. And um, this is due to the fact that there is a different uh, scattering um, between the gray matter and the white matter of the neural tissue. And there's a, a difference in the structure of the tissue. So this difference uh, reflects easily uh, in changes in the uh, scattering of the light. And if you check on the different wavelengths, you can actually enhance your information and get images like that. Another example of the same uh, uh, tissue samples where we can actually see that in higher wavelengths there is uh, even less absorption or scattering uh, in this case. But then we can actually have different information extracted from our samples. One other example of uh, multispectral imaging is a flower. Uh, this is how we see it in the visible. This is how the insects, I believe, that they are sensitive in the UV light, maybe. so you can see how uh, they can <coughs> see the flower. This is in the blue light, in the green, and in the red, where there is no actual absorption of any pigment. It's approximately the same image as if, if you go in higher wavelengths, in higher infrared light. Now I'll show you some uh, applications of the offline imaging spectrometry, where we actually calculate in each pixel all the reflection spectrum Come from our samples. I don't have biological samples here, so I'll show you some artworks. Where in this pigment, in this artwork, we have this chimney which has a red color, and down here you see all the set of the images, the individual spectral images that we are acquiring. And if you go and calculate each point of the image, you can actually get uh, a red line like this. This is made from uh, made by our system, Iris, here where we actually compare this reflection spectrum with some reference samples that we have. These are the three lines that are coming from specific uh, samples. And we compare and we know which pigment 
this is. In this specific uh, case, it's vermilion red. One other example is uh, in this artwork, some black pigments, very uh, highly absorbing pigments in the decimal, where if you look at them by eye, it's almost impossible to discriminate them and say if these are different or not pigments. And uh, if you take the reflection spectrum from each point, you will see that they differ significantly. You see here how um, reflectivity is increased after 650 nanometers, while in this case, you have a much higher reflectivity in the infrared on the first one. And this can be seen, especially at 950 nanometers, where you have a number 50 of the reflectivity here, while in this case, you have 150, three times more um, highly reflected uh, light than the other one in the low. So you can see a small difference here, I believe. It's more light than this case. It's not very clear visible in the projector. Okay, so in the second case where we're dealing with hyperspectral imaging, there are many different um, approaches. The best one that uh, exists in the market right now is uh, specking from a specific company that actually takes one single line of spatial information, analyzes this information in uh, uh, the spectrum, and uh, projects that into an array sensor. By doing that, you can get in a two-dimensional array, you get one dimension of spectral information and one dimension of spatial information. By scanning your sample with this sensor, you can actually acquire a very high resolution uh, spectral cube. So high resolution, in spectral uh, information, high resolution in uh, spatial information. But it requires scanning and quite some time to do the scanning. So it's not made for real-time imaging of a specific object. Now, there is another approach that we did in the lab by using a uh, linear variable interference filter and some optics. We were able to uh, have a, a larger set of spectral images, spectral uh, images on the range of, uh, in the visible range, 400 to 700 nanometers, with a bandwidth of um, approximately 15 to 25 nanometers. And we used that in two cases, one in a microscope, and second on the uh, fundus camera for uh, imaging the back of the eye, like all the images we have seen here. This is an example of some images that have been acquired with the hyperspectral images in uh, from this camera that we've developed in collaboration with uh, the Bell Institute, the University of Greek. So this is how the retina appears in the in the visible range. If you look all the if you take all the band uh, of the visible between 400 and 700 nanometers, but if you are more focused on 465 nanometers, you see the absorption of something in the center. 409, you're still in the blue region. But you see that there is still some absorption here of something, but not in such a high contrast as it, as it was at 465. You also observe that at 540 nanometers in the green light, where the peak absorption of uh, hemoglobin exists, you have a higher absorption than the contrast of the veins <coughs> that uh, are on the retina. And where uh, when you go to the red uh, color, the red uh, wave events, range, you see that there is no absorption of hemoglobin, and also there is a red pigment epithelium that's becoming transparent and will have some image of the back of the eye, um, some base that exist uh, on the behind the retina. Um, okay, when we have the full set of the images then, we are, it is possible to calculate, like we said before, the spectrum for every image pixel, which is this one. And wherever you go the bounds, you can actually click in every point and get a reflective spectrum like that. By doing that, you can go to any point of your image that you want and get the reflective spectrum of various uh, pigments, various areas. So we have here a uh, reflective spectrum from the veins, from uh, the uh, Retina fibrosa, uh, lamina fibrosa of uh, the optical nerve. We have on the background some different pigments that exist there. 
So is it possible to perform the Ivanov sum with Kotlin Imagine? The answer is yes. It is possible because we can be able to detect tissue pathology, like in this case where there are some veins that are getting through the retina, through the macula, and are uh, destroying all the codes that exist in the specific area coming out, which is not clearly visible uh, in uh, the normal photos camera, photos uh, image that we can get with the uh, existing instrumentation. And also we can see that mapping of the veins here is much more clear, so even smaller veins are visible, while in the color image you're not possible, it's not possible to do that. So what is the future of spectral imaging? Well, we can actually focus in two different directions. One is material models, cloud computing and databases of pigments, of existing pigments and normal pigments. And by using novel algorithms and methods, we have a very promising analytical technology. On the other hand, we can inspect in even narrow bands, increasing the contrast between specific features or pigments <coughs> that we want on our sample in real time. And by performing powerful artificial technologies uh, on the samples, we can actually map and monitor the changes of specific areas of interest that we have. And the combination of those two <coughs> will lead us to something new that we'll probably not aware yet. Our approach of new, approach of new instrumentation design and new techniques is uh, this example where we develop um, a new hyperspectral imaging system that was working not only in the visible and in the infrared part, but also in the uh, short uh, wavelength infrared spectrum, which comes from 900 up to 2500 nanometers. And also we incorporated 3D imaging along with spectral imaging on the same sample at the same time. This is uh, referring to the development of this system, the prototype that we have. So you can see that it's a complicated uh, instrument. It's not something very simple to do. And some results. We have an artwork, because it was tested on artworks up to now. We will start testing the biological samples really soon. And you see that we have the 3D reconstruction of the surface of the sample that we measured. It's, it was a, a one artwork. And we were trying to see the, uh, to measure the deterioration changes that existed in two different areas that you see, area one and area two. This is the set of the visible images that we acquired from 400 up to 700 nanometers. So you will see that in some images, after um, you go in higher wireless close to the red region, we are starting to observe differences between this area and the other one, which are the two <coughs> reference areas that we were measuring. So this area, you see, it becomes more, trans more reflective, which means that it's more deteriorated, we say. And there is another set of images in the 900 up to 2500 nanometers, short wave, uh, different light. And you will observe some rapid uh, changes, some rapid changes in the intensity, which are not fake, are, it's a reality, it's a differences in the absorption of the whole sample. And you will see those now, <coughs> as we did some measurements on the specific points. So in the visible region, the differences are small, and only when you go in higher wavelengths, this is close to the red, you start observing some differences. But if you go in even higher wavelengths, from 900 to 25 nanometers, you see that there's a lot of character, uh, spectral characteristics which represent information about the deteriorated areas and the actual pigment as it was before. After that, we, are, we have developed some uh, extra samples that were artificially deteriorated with um, temperature and uh, relative humidity or with UV. So we have these samples and we measure the specific pigments and we found out that there are some changes uh, in each pigment uh, and we measured all the uh, spectrum from that. We put them in the database and we used some signature uh, classification techniques with principal component analysis and by doing that we try to map the changes of these 
deterioration, the deterioration mainly of the pigments on the different samples. And as you can see, there are some samples here that have been Okay, so this is one area here that is been changed completely in the UV area. And also, we have changes here in the first one and on this one somewhere over here. So it is possible to map changes and know exactly what type of deterioration you have based on uh, databases and the uh, risk of abundant analysis techniques. Thank you very much. There are the multispectra, that are, there are approximately three or four different companies that develop uh, multispectral imaging technologies. And there is the hyperspectral imaging technology, which is only one at this moment. It's this technique that actually scans one single line of uh, spatial information, and you need to scan by moving the translation stage to your sample uh, below and get all the information that you want. It's a very good instrument. It has some limitations. And the other solution is the one I, I showed you with um, what we did with our hyperspectral imaging system, the monochromatic illumination of <coughs> this one, the linear environment, the finance filter. This was one solution. It doesn't have the best uh, spectral resolution. We go approximately to 15 nanometers, while the specimen instrument goes to 2.5 nanometers of spectral resolution, but it can go really fast. And you can actually go and sit in every wavelength that you want and observe your sample <coughs> in real time. So do you think, uh, I mean, do you believe that you can put this into the market? I mean, sometimes it's around. Well. <laughs> we tried to do that, I think, but there was uh, too many issues at that time. I'm so we didn't uh, proceed on putting that in market. This has only been developed by us and only been used in two applications. One was the retinal imaging, 
And one was a microscope when it was uh, broken up, but never again. Was uh, part of a PhD thesis and well, but why don't you uh, I mean, try to <coughs> to make a validation for that at the table? I mean, make a collaboration with uh, some uh, people in Bremen, uh, for example, and you know, study five hundred or thousand or fifty different people and see what the result There are some ideas about uh, new type of instrumentation. Uh, can you ah. be better on this one? Did you do any type of uh, unmixing, special unmixing of these uh, instruments to, to get your, uh, your, your images? Yes, the uh, image that you saw before with the retina, uh -huh. is actually uh, processing after this for component analysis. Okay, so you can do this one with this here. Yeah, this is this here. And then with, uh, we saw this uh, uh, gray and white matter. And you said that it might be the difference might come from uh, from scattering. It's from scattering. How how do you distinguish also from uh, from scattering? Mm -hmm. How do you do you put any I don't know like polarizing uh, effect? Ah, okay, so you do it. Uh, so you don't you don't put it in uh, your algorithm. Uh, Later, you do it with uh, the you do the cross polarization and then we perform spectral imaging and define what is the best way in order to have the best uh, contrast between the gray and the white map. Okay. And there are huge differences between the uh, uh, yeah, uh, so This is something that the two we, need. we need to discuss about this because this okay. uh, is and, and, uh, okay. I remember in some discussion that uh, did you do some correction with uh, the movement of the eye, right? Or not? Yes, I did not focus here, but indeed, due to the movement of the eye or of the sandwich, if it's smooth, then we can do this study afterwards. Correct. Um, the so the images with uh, advanced algorithms, but we thought it was not important for this presentation. Yes, it is possible to do that. Yeah. We have uh, developed a new algorithm now, it's called ServC. Computer vision algorithms, but I'm very advanced for this. I come from another part of spectral imaging, that is from X rays. Uh, you mentioned that in the future of uh, spectral imaging, the optical spectral imaging, there is a potential to be used as an analytical method. That means that you may be used someday as a mental analysis method. Uh, and I'm asking this because in X-rays there's a lot of research work being done time on spectral uh, applications where you scan uh, an object with two different energies, beam spectra, and make elemental analysis. Do you think this method, the optical method, can be used for elemental analysis to distinguish the exact composition of uh, the tissue? Every every spectral band or the region electromagnetic uh, spectrum is actually uh, concentrated in different uh, absorption or in a different uh, light matter interaction. So it provides different uh, results. I believe that indeed <coughs> if you limit your ranges and you know, your spectral range in narrow bands and be able to acquire a specific set of images, yes, you are able to perform a higher analytical method than the one used right now. So I believe yes, but uh, I'm not aware of the results for X-ray uh, imaging at this moment and how the absorption peaks and all the uh, information, the chemical information that this uh, region is. So I cannot give you a very uh, a solution right now, but I can tell you that yes, indeed it's possible. That's what from the uh, the different 
materials absorb differently the spectra. Yes. Here, different materials have uh, reflect. It's the same thing. Yes, it's exactly the same idea and the same principle. It's the same. Each material reflects different uh, wavelengths. <coughs>